So again, from John chapter 3, verses 22 to 30. Please listen to the reading of the Word of God. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized. For John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness, bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. This is the word of the Lord. He must increase, but I must decrease. Such an amazing verse and so countercultural in a, in a world in where everybody is trying to increase, to increase social media followers, to increase their position in life, to increase their salary and their job, to increase at the expense of others. John tells us one of our life mottos. He must increase, Jesus Christ, and I must decrease. As we open our text, we see that Jesus Christ's ministry has begun. In chapter 2, he turns water into wine, kicking this off. He's had conversation with religious leaders as they've questioned him about who he is. He told them, you must be born again. And, And now he and his disciples are doing ministry, and people are coming to him. And our text says that he's baptizing. Now, it's interesting because the the very next chapter in John 4, John the writer will tell us that Jesus actually wasn't baptizing, but his disciples were baptizing. In other words, the works of the group that was with Jesus are attributed to Christ because they're doing it in his name. And so people are coming to Jesus. Our text has an odd comment in verse 24, for John had not yet been put in prison. And why I say it's an odd comment, because obviously he had not been put in prison because he's still doing ministry. And so people kind of wonder, why is that even there? And what most people settle on, and I agree with, is, is I think this is another indication that John is aware of the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because at the point when Jesus' ministry begins, John's looks like it ends right there, like it's a clean kind of break. And what I think John the writer is saying here is, no, no, there's more that kind of happened. Let me tell you about what happened. The text that we're studying has both narrow and broad implications. There's application here for us about our horizontal relationships, how we view one another in things like comparison and competition, things that are actually crippling in this life. But yet the, the bigger point, the greater point in this text is how we are to live in light of who we are to live for. See, the point of this text is how we are to live or view life in light of who we are to live for. And so while there is application that we're going to spend the first third of the sermon, talking about this idea of comparison and competition. The greater reality is how we are to view ourselves in this world, and that gives us true identity, purpose, and meaning, and joy. Isn't that what we're all searching for? Let's look at three points. They're in your worship program. Comparisons, Christ, and contentment, and then there's sub-points there, comparison, Jealousy over baptism, Christ, 
Jesus as the bridegroom and contentment, joy, and our purpose. There's a famous quote, have you heard it? Comparison is the thief of joy. Have you ever heard anybody say that or that anywhere, read it anywhere? Comparison is the thief of joy. Sometimes it's said as the thief of contentment. I looked it up, and most sources attribute it to Teddy Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt, president of a hundred years ago or more. But some sources say it was Mark Twain, and other sources say it was C.S. Lewis. And I can't find the actual quote. But evidence goes that this has been sort of a, a, the theme of it has been around for hundreds of years. So whoever said it, comparison is the thief of joy, regardless of who said it. Isn't it true? You ever find yourself happy with something in your life, something you have, something that is perfectly fine for what you, and then you see somebody who has one that's better or newer or more valuable, and suddenly you're a little less happy about what it is. A new car is very exciting when you first get it. Then two years down the road, it's not new anymore. There's nothing wrong with it. It runs fine. There's no problems. And you start to wish you had the later model, the newer model, because your neighbor has it. Comparison. Comparisons come along so often, like around reunion times, like the 10-year reunion, the 20-year reunion from high school or college. Do you ever see what everybody's doing? Does it ever bother you? Like, do you ever not go to your high school reunion because you're afraid that others have done better in life or your life's a mess? You compare things. This happens to adults. It happens to kids. It's prom season. Young ladies are... Comparing dresses. It's college acceptance season. Most kids maybe know where they're going at this point, but some don't get into the schools they wanted to get into. And so you ask them, like, like where, are you, like, where are you going? Are you excited? And and they kind of like say it with some self-deprecation because they didn't get in where their friends got in. Comparison. It robs of joy. And in that, there's, there's competition. Why do you think that is? Why does, and, and really at least to jealousy, right? Jealousy. Why do we do these comparisons, and why do we get jealous? So if you have a car that is good and perfectly great, and your neighbor has a more expensive or better or flashier one, why does that make somebody jealous of them? Maybe it's not a car, maybe it's a house. Maybe you just go into your friend's house and you walk in and there's this jealousy because they have nicer things, it's updated, yours isn't. What is it about jealousy? Why why is that a part of human nature, fallen human nature? At its core... Because we think our life has meaning and purpose by things. And things can be actual things or ideas or things. So our accomplishments, our possessions, our position give us value in our mind. And if we see others have more or are better in those things, we think that makes us less. Is that just an issue of unbelief? At the end of the day, we believe that God will love us less or that God cares for us less, like if he gave this person this thing and I don't have that thing, maybe I'm not as valuable as that person. It's unbelief. And yet, like I said, we see that it is just inherent in human nature. You know, isn't it almost like Eve in the garden, and there's always to look at her eating that fruit, but, but one lens to look at it through is she thought she was entitled to that. Why couldn't she have it? 
The very next story, the, the Cain and Abel story, Cain makes a sacrifice and Abel makes a sacrifice. Abel's is pleasing to God and Cain's isn't. We understand in that God's not arbitrary. There, there's something in their hearts in those sacrifices and what was going on. That, and God calls Cain out on it. And what does Cain do rather than repent? He kills his brother because of jealousy, comparison, and competition. Joseph's brothers throw him in a pit because of jealousy. Their father loved him more. He got more of the blessings and the benefits. We see that's what's going on in our text as you look at it, right? Verse 25, a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and, Jew, and a Jew over purification, whoever that was. And so then they asked John about Jesus baptizing. So clearly you have like competing baptism ministries. And maybe this Jew is really curious. Maybe he's just trying to cause trouble. Typically, when John's gospel uses the word Jew, it's really referring to, like, the religious leaders. And so saying, hey, uh, John's baptizing, but I noticed that guy Jesus over there, he's getting bigger crowds, and he's baptizing. So it causes jealousy immediately, right? I mean, you see that. He who was with you in the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him, all. Now, they're still baptizing, so clearly not all are, you know, it's like, it's like when your kids come to you and say, everybody's doing this. And you're like, well, is it everybody? Everybody, all. They're jealous. Now, if you know the Gospels a little bit, you know who were Jesus' first disciples? Do you remember? They were John's disciples. In other words, John has disciples, and some have left John. John even said, look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Go after him. And, and they go and they follow Jesus. And so now they're doing what they did with John, but they're doing it with Jesus. But then there's this devoted group who stayed with John. Do you see how there could be jealousy there? They could view, like, Peter as a traitor. He's a traitor. You know, corporate America, what do they, they have non-compete clauses, like, if you leave, you can't go to our competitor. And John's disciples, that's the way they're thinking. Look, they're taking what we did and they're doing it. Now, what was, what was John doing? John was proclaiming a message. Matthew's gospel says it this way. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Matthew tells us he is the one who's the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord, make his path straight. And so John was preparing the way, calling people to repentance and doing this baptism. And you see in our text, it talks about purification. So this symbolic of preparing the way for the Messiah to come. And John is pointing to the Messiah and people are going to him, to Jesus. causes jealousy. So John highlights, verse 27, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from above. He says, I told you over there, it's not me that I'm here to point the way to him. We already saw in John 1. But don't you know that a person cannot get anything unless it's given him from God? Christian, this is so important. Everything you have is because God wants you to have that. And everything you don't have is because he doesn't want you to have that. Position, power, possessions, all of it. Romans 13.1 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Why? For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Isn't this what Jesus tells Pilate in John 19? Pilate says, don't you know I have the power over life and death? I can set you free or I could put you on a cross. What does Jesus say? You have no authority over me. Any authority that's been given, that you have is because it's been given to you by my Father. James 1, every good and perfect gift is from above, from the Father, coming down from the Father of lights. Everything we have. And yet that condition, right, 
Now, these followers of, of John, and then the ones that are baptizing with Jesus that were followers with John, of John, do you know that they did the same thing when they were with Jesus? We saw this three times in Mark's gospel. What do they fight over all the time? Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? And it, here's the thing. Here's the, so so it's, it's, it's mind-boggling. It always happens in Mark's got Matthew, Mark, or Luke. It's three times. Always happens when Christ is most magnificent and glorious. The transfiguration, the proclamation that he's the Christ. Something like that. Then you see the disciples going off to the side, arguing not about Jesus being the greatest, but who among them is greater than the other. Rather than be focused and fixated on the beauty and the glory and the majesty of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh among them, they, they see he's going to have power. Who of us is going to be next? And Jesus usually takes a little baby at that moment. He says, you see this child? You have to enter the kingdom of heaven like this child. This child is greater than all. Why? Because the child has nothing to offer except love. <laughs> love and need. The baby needs. The baby can't offer anything. I mean, yes, we smile. We love the baby. We hug the baby. That makes us feel good, but can't do anything. Everything has to be done for this child. And Jesus Christ says, if you want to be greatest in the kingdom, you come with the most need. Not with what you bring with your hands not with what you offer. You come recognizing that Jesus Christ has rescued you and you just, you have a place in the kingdom. Now here's the thing, notice this. It's not a matter of ability. It's not a matter of ability. Jesus Christ says in Matthew's gospel that not, a greater man has not walked the earth than John the Baptist. He's not... Obviously, Jesus has, but you get that point. Besides himself, John the Baptist is the greatest. It's not a matter of ability. And so many of us feel looked over like we deserve more, better, whatever, not realizing that God has you right where you are because that's where he wants you to be. I remember when I was looking at colleges in high school, knowing I wanted to be an engineer. Uh, I was in South Florida, and at the time, South Florida didn't have many, like, nationally known engineering schools, and uh, there was this sort of family idea that I would go to Notre Dame because my family had history with Notre Dame. We were Catholic, and uh, my grandfather, my dad's father that I'm named for, knew the president of Notre Dame, and maybe I'd go there. Uh, so I applied to Notre Dame, but I didn't tell them who I didn't tell them of the connection, and they only accept less than 10% of the applicants, and I didn't get in. And I was actually fine with that, because I was kind of a proud kid, and I was like, if they don't want me, I don't want to go there. I'm not going to press on my grandfather's connection, even though I have his same name. Uh, I wanted to go to Georgia Tech. I just, I had family in Atlanta, I knew it was a good engineering school, and I got in early decision, it was like, November or December, and the rest of the year, I was skating by, I'm going to Georgia Tech. And I wore that identity. I had shirts, hats. And, and then the spring came, and I found out we couldn't afford it. Because although they were um, a state school, I was out of state, and they didn't offer any, this is in the 90s, I don't know if anything's changed, they didn't offer any financial aid to out-of-state people. They just couldn't afford it. And suddenly, I felt like identity had been stripped from me because for a year, I've been telling people that's where I want to go. I get in, and now I can't go. And I felt like I deserved to go. The money, you know. Well, the Lord orchestrated for me to go to this other school called Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute that nobody can say. Uh, it's actually the first engineering school in the country. Um, second, oh, after West Point. Thank you, Mr. Military. After, it's the first civilian one. <laughs> Or are you going to tell me Virginia Tech was first? Okay, Virginia Tech. But we digress. Uh, the point is, within a half a year, I knew why I was at that other school. Because I had family around me. It was in upstate New York where I had a lot of family. I had teachers and resources that were pouring into me, and I was struggling that first year. 
And it was so evident. But then, 25 years later, I look back on my life, and I would not be who I am had I gone to Georgia Tech. Now, Georgia Tech's a fine school. I wanted to go there. But in other words, who I am today is because of the decisions that the Lord was working out in my life then and even before then. I wouldn't know my wife. I wouldn't be married. I wouldn't be a pastor here. Guaranteed. I guarantee it because my route went through upstate New York that brought me back down to Florida and to here. God knows why he has you, where he has you, for his purposes, and get this, for your good. All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. His purposes and your good are aligned. And so every time we are uncontent or compare sinfully, I don't think all comparisons are sinful, by the way. Sometimes it's good you could see what you can achieve and you can, and then you, comparisons aren't necessarily bad. It helps you to be better. But all sinful comparisons, all jealousy, all that kind of stuff is, is, is a sin against the God who has given you all things for your good. You're taking the gifts that he gives you. I'm taking the gifts that he gives us and saying, I wish I had that instead of this. And yet he's making us who he wants us to be through that. God has you where you are for a reason. And because God has you there, it is a royal calling. It's a royal calling. You know, when I, again, when I was an engineer, and I know there's engineers here and there's doctors here and lawyers here, and so we have professions, you know, that people tend to look up to. But when I left that and had no plan, except I thought I might become a teacher, but I knew I had to get certified, I knew I had to take classes, I knew there was work to be done. Some people were like, yeah, live your dream. <laughs> Stick it to the man. Get out of the rat race. Other people looked at me and said, what are you, crazy? Don't you see what we have? Comparison. Now, I've been a boss. I've been an employee. I've been a number one. I've been a number two. I've done menial jobs. I've done what society considers to be great jobs. I've been in authority and I've been under authority. Do we think that our worth and value has anything to do with any of that? The world thinks that. But Jesus says what? He says, if you want to be greatest in the kingdom, be the least. And do you know there's millions of unsung heroes that you'll never know their names? And all the people in lights and are popular and in the media, and so often their lives are a wreck and debaucherous, and we, we know their accomplishments. And so I was thinking again of the Covenant school shooting about a couple weeks ago, a month ago, maybe, I don't know. And, you know, all the focus on, again, the pastor, it's PCA pastor, so that hits close to home, and then his nine-year-old daughter who was killed, right? But it was occurring to me right from the beginning, like, that's where all the attention is going. But a number of people died. And I was just amazed at the story of, let me see, I wrote his name down somewhere because I forgot, Mike Hill. 61-year-old Mike Hill. You heard that name? He's the custodian of the school. He's a grandfather. He worked at the school for many years. And people who loved him, because he's a custodian in a private school, don't make the most money, they ran a little GoFundMe campaign to help his family pay for medical costs. And I think they wanted like 20 grand or 40 grand. I mean, he's, nobody knows who he is. He's not the pastor in the PCA that's kind of out front. Can they get 20 or 40 grand for Mike Hill? Right now, the GoFundMe thing is up to almost $700,000. 
and all the comments are all the students that came through that school that Mr. Mike or Big Mike poured into as the custodian of the school. And his reward is great in heaven right now. Right now. But not because of what he did, but because of what Jesus did for him. And he just, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Colossians uh, 3, or that's 1 Corinthians. Colossians 3 is, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So John the Baptist says, I am not the Christ. The Christ is the Messiah, the King, the one who will fix all things. He points to Jesus as the bridegroom. In our terms, is the groom. He's the groom. Now, John's gospel so beautifully does this, like gives us beautiful pictures to understand who Jesus Christ is. And John the Baptist, in John's gospel, has just given us two, because what did he tell us Jesus was in the first chapter? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Thinking of the sacrifices and the Passovers and, uh, and, and all of that. Well, now, Jesus tells us about Jesus, uh, John tells us about Jesus as the bridegroom. But think of all the beautiful analogies in John's gospel for who Jesus is. He's the logos, the light, the light of life. He is the life. He's the lamb of God. He's the bronze serpent lifted up. He's the bread of life, the vine, the door. He's the son of God. He's the son of man. All pictures teaching us about who our wonderful savior is. And here he's the groom. Now, what John is doing here is not just some cute analogy. God, Yahweh, in the Old Testament, was the groom of Israel. Is Isaiah 54, 5. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. He is the redeemer. Isaiah 61, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul will exalt in God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. It speaks of a future, future wedding where the groom clothes his bride in beauty, and, and they are wed together, and this is God. And John says, that's who, the, that's who that is. John says, I'm just the friend. I'm just the best man. And there's more going on in the picture to this because unlike, I mean, I know today the best man, what does he do? He, he stands with the groom and maybe he does a bachelor party or something. But back then, the best man was in charge of all the details of the wedding. He was probably, in John 2, the guy who was the steward of the wedding, most likely. That kind of an idea. The best man was there to announce the wedding, take care of the details of the wedding, also to protect the bride. He guarded the bridal chamber and made sure nobody entered. Did you know that in, in, in that part of the world at this time, there were actually laws on the books, not in Judaism, but the surrounding cultures, that the best man could not marry the bride if the wedding didn't work out. So if the bride and the groom, something happened... The best man can't marry her so as not to give the impression that he broke up the wedding. And John is saying, I'm the best man. The bride isn't mine. But all this details and all the pointing to this wedding and this beautiful thing, my, it makes me joyful because he's the groom and he's why I exist in this. We've talked so many times about the Bible as... The, the picture of a wedding and marriage. It's why we protect God's plan for marriage so much. Paul says in Ephesians 5 that this mystery about marriage is profound because he's talking about Christ and the church. And we picture the garden, that the first sort of act after things are created is God marries a couple. You say, well, that doesn't say marriage. Jesus calls it marriage. When he's talking about marriage, he says, haven't you heard? And he quotes Genesis 1 and 2. When Paul talks about marriage, when Peter talks about marriage, they quote Genesis 1 and 2. There, there's a marriage where a husband and a wife 
come together, two becoming one flesh. They are naked and unashamed, and their hearts are beating as one. And what happens? They turn on each other. Better yet, Adam turned on his bride. It's almost like a competition. That woman you gave me made me eat the fruit. And all the home was thrown into chaos. What's the home? The whole world? I mean, you think of your marriages in your homes, and when your marriage is not two hearts beating as one, but two people at odds in competition, comparison, and everything else with one another, it creates chaos in the home. And that's what happens in Eden, and all creation is groaning, Romans 8. And so God sends a new Adam, a second Adam, Jesus Christ, his own son, to be the groom who doesn't point the blame at the bride, but says, I take her blame on me. He pays the price to keep her innocent, to make her innocent. Revelation ends, so the first three chapters of the Bible, which is Genesis, the last three chapters of the Bible, which is Revelation, begins with a wedding and ends with a wedding. And what's broken in the first three chapters is fixed in the last three chapters. And behold, the bride has made herself ready. She is clothed in righteousness. Whose righteousness? The grooms. Jesus Christ. John the Baptist doesn't want to trade Christ's righteousness for his own, for the bride. He's pointing to the groom, Jesus Christ. He's a pointer. For John the Baptist to try to compete with Christ is to make his place, his purpose, uh, is, to, is to mistake his place and purpose. But when he sees Jesus take his place, he's like, oh, my joy is complete. He goes to prison after this, and he'll be rotting in prison because he challenges the king, and he tells the king what he's doing is immoral and not allowed, and he's under threat of death. And John wavers a little bit, and he sends followers, maybe these same followers, to Jesus, and he says, John wants to know, are you the one? You know, in other words, John wants to know, did I dedicate my life to the right pursuit? You're not meeting the expectations the way I, we thought. I want to know, if, if I'm going to die, did I die for the right thing? Jesus says... Go tell John what you see in here. The lame walk, the blind see, and the poor have good news preached to them. And he's quoting Isaiah. John knows what the Messiah was come to do, and Jesus is saying, you go tell him. And I can picture John in those moments quoting this same thing. My, the jo my joy is now complete. Because he's pointing to Christ. Now John's purpose is actually our purpose. Now, John's purpose is our purpose. Like, John had a, a purpose, and, and it played out uniquely in John's life, but his purpose is our purpose, to point to Jesus. That is your purpose. That is what you are made for. Westminster Shorter Catechism 1, what is, the, what is your purpose? What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. And we see how the two fit together. Our world is reeling because people think they are pursuing their purposes, but they're not pursuing the purpose of the one who made them who knows their purpose. And so as Augustine says, our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they find their rest in you. I use this analogy and illustration when I talk about identity. You know, it's kind of a big theme for us because so often we live in our, the man-made identities we have for ourselves. I've done that so many times in my life about my career or whatever else. And, you know, you, you take a hammer and a screwdriver and you know what they're made for because of how they're designed. And the designer, the one who made the hammer or the screwdriver, made them to fit the design. And so if you try to use a hammer to pound in a screw, 
you're going to break it. You're either going to break what it's going into or you're going to dent the screw or whatever. If you try to use a screwdriver, a Phillips screwdriver, to pound in a nail, you're going to break the tool, probably. The designer tells us what we're made for and designs us uniquely for that purpose. In the fallen world, we think our purpose is other things. But our hearts are restless until they find their rest in Christ. John's joy is complete. He says, he, Jesus Christ, must increase and I must decrease. An amazing outlook for John and his disciples. Their ministry is done. John will go to prison, and I hope the rest of these followers of John go to follow Jesus. And they may have been important in John's world, but the rest of these guys don't become the disciples in Jesus' world, but they are still precious to Christ. We got to know who we are. God tells us. There's an interesting story about a Baptist preacher in the 1800s named F.B. Meyer. Have you ever heard of him? Well, some of you say, yeah, that's great. Most people haven't. He written, he's written dozens of books. He spoke at many conferences uh, of his day, and he was a well-known preacher. But something happened in his world. His world was turned upside down because he had a successful church with a successful ministry, a successful preaching ministry. But suddenly, his crowd started dwindling because a new guy came up the road, young whippersnapper. He was 19, drawing gigantic crowds. His name was Charles Spurgeon. And Meyer started getting jealous And I can imagine, I don't know for sure, I can imagine part of it was the guy's age. Like here, I've been faithfully serving the Lord. Like kind of like the older brother in the prodigal. I've been faithfully serving. And this young kid comes in and starts telling everybody, and everybody's going to him. But this is what he said. so, So the story goes. I can't find the source. But it's, I've seen it in books. Uh, PCA books even. So, so the story goes. He said he realized that jealousy not only robbed his joy, but was sin. And so he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pray for Spurgeon. I'm going to pray that God packs his church out, that people come from all over to worship in Spurgeon's church and hear the gospel preached. And the reason he said that was because I can't hate or be jealous about what I've prayed to come to pass. <laughs> I hope that story's true, but the, sta- the, the point is true. If you are fervently praying for something, when, it's, when you see it happening, so he said as he would see the carriages go by with, and throngs of people pass the church to go to Spurgeon's church, he, he just praised God and he thought that those successes were his successes in the Lord because he prayed for them. Now that's a good way to spin it. There's two songs that I really love, and the, the, the sad thing is I think they're competing with each other. One is a song by Nicole Nordeman uh, called Legacy, and it's a pop song. I'm not saying it's a song to sing during worship or whatever, but you know that song? It starts off talking about like the, the, the things you value in the world, and then she says this, I want to leave a legacy. How will they remember me? Did I choose to love? Did I point to you, obviously Christ, enough? To make a mark on things, I want to leave an offering, a child of mercy and grace who blessed your name unapologetically and leave that kind of legacy. I said, that's actually a good prayer. Like in life, I I want to be known for pointing to Christ. So for some reason, I don't know why, another band, I'm not going to even say why, and I like the band, and I like this song too, but they write this, I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care if they remember me. So it's obviously against this song, but it says, I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care if they remember me. Only Jesus. I've only got one life to live, and every second I'll point to him. Only Jesus. Well, amen. Only Jesus. The problem is not if you leave a legacy. The problem is whose legacy are you leaving? 
The Bible is full of people who left a legacy for, for God. Hebrews 11. The Hall of Saints. I mean, it's like, does God want us to remember the faithful saints? Yes. Now, I don't care if I'm remembered or not remembered, but if I'm remembered, I want to be remembered that I, that I pointed to Jesus, that I repented when I needed to, that I loved people who didn't love me, that I raised my kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord, but did so with truth and love. Like, that Jesus was my reason for existence. That's, if, if there's a legacy, that's, that's what I want to leave. That's what I want to leave. And Paul models this in, uh, in Philippians. Philippians is an amazing letter at this, because remember, John says, my joy is complete because he sees what's happening with Christ. Like, can you revel and joy in the fact that there's success that's outside of you, but God's getting the glory for it. So Paul says in, in Philippians 1.15, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love. The former do it out of selfish ambition. What does Paul say? What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Paul doesn't care that he's being maligned because if Christ is being proclaimed, now, I think he did care, but he's, making, he, he's mustering up faith. In 1 Corinthians, he says they're competing. Well, some are of Apollos, and some are of Peter, and some are of Paul. And Paul says, that doesn't matter. One watered, one planted, the other one saw the increase. It's all for the glory of God. So first, Philippians 1 goes on, and it says, this, Philippians 1, 21 to 20, uh, 21, 22. Oops. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall not choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Consider this, that I will remain and continue for your all and your progress and joy in the faith. So Paul is fine with whatever Christ wants to do with him. He's in prison. If, Christ is, if he is to be killed, that's fine. I'll be with Christ. If I'm to live, then for me to live is Christ. That's why Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's what Paul says. In Philippians 3, he says, I count everything as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And then what does he say in Philippians 4? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Don't be anxious. He's Joy. Joy. And that's what John is saying here. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. Can you rejoice in what God is doing in your life? Can you rejoice in what God is doing in somebody else's life, even if you want what he's doing in their life? Can you pray for them, maybe like F.B. Meyer, and, and then you rejoice as they're rejoicing because God's answering your prayers? Do you want to build up your own castle, your own kingdom, or do you want to build God's kingdom? There's a quote that's attributed to Meyer. What's funny about that is I told you about the whole Spurgeon-Meyer thing. I, I can't find Meyer saying it anywhere, but I found it in Spurgeon's sermon, so go figure. Maybe Spurgeon stole it from him, or maybe everybody's wrong. <laughs> get, get this. Peace is joy resting, and joy is peace dancing. Peace is joy at rest, and joy is peace at dance. Something to think about. Listen, if you want to mash your own record, your own identity, your own purpose, you can. At the end, it won't matter. And even if it's your reputation, you know how quick a reputation goes away? You could spend 20 years, 30 years, 40 years building a reputation for it to be wiped out from you in a second. Jesus says, don't Store up for yourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy, where steeds break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven 
where those things don't happen for where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. And we take that as possessions, and I, and I get that. Guy builds barns, he gets more produce, he builds more barns, and he's, you foolish man, you're going to die tomorrow. But sometimes the treasures we're building up are ideas about who we are. And those are going to go away. He must increase, and I must decrease. He must become greater, and I must become lesser. Now, here's the the, the profound thing. This is the wrap-up. One more minute. We think that's about John's position and Christ's position. And in the context of the text, it is. John's ministry will decrease and Christ will increase. But what John is saying is profound for each and every one of you, not just in how you live your life in the world, but you, inside you. George must decrease and Christ must increase in every aspect of my life. He must take over my life. I must lose my life in him so that I gain him. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I've been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. We got more of you and less of me, more Jesus, less George. He's making me a better me because he's making me more and more like Christ. He must increase and we must decrease. Let's pray.